Are we getting close to a cure for Alzheimer's disease? Keep watching to find out more. If you haven't watched before, my name is Dr. Nicole Didick. I'm an internist and geriatrician, and here on The Wrinkle, I try to give you information that you can use to age well, or to help someone close to you to age well. As a geriatrician, a big part of my practice is dementia, and the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. I'm filming this in January 2021, and it's Alzheimer's Awareness Month. So if you've watched some of my other videos, uh, we've talked about how to eat well and do exercise and live a healthy lifestyle to try to prevent dementia. I've also got quite a few resources about the medications that we currently use to treat the symptoms of Alzheimer's. And I will leave those linked down below as well as on my website if you wanna get some background there. But those are just treatments for the symptoms. We don't have a cure for Alzheimer's. Today, I wanna give you some information about some of the newer agents that are being proposed as treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And some of them are pretty exciting. So let's start by taking a look at Alzheimer's disease and how it affects the brain. Alzheimer's disease affects hundreds of thousands of Canadians. And behind everyone who's living with Alzheimer's is a care partner, at least one, and sometimes entire families. The cost of Alzheimer's is about $6 billion per year. It's the most common cause of dementia. So remember that dementia is the umbrella term and there are different types of dementia, but Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause there. Some people have Alzheimer's as well as another type of disease um, that would contribute to a mixed dementia, for example. So if somebody has Alzheimer's and then also has a stroke, we would call that a dementia of mixed etiology due to Alzheimer's as well as a vascular dementia. So if Alzheimer's isn't the primary disease, it's often a co-conspirator in producing that dementia. And remember too that dementia causes difficulties with memory as well as other parts of brain function. So in Alzheimer's disease in particular, short-term memory is almost always affected and often it's the first thing that's affected. And the longer that someone lives with dementia, the more brain difficulties will occur and the more those brain difficulties will get in the way of life. In the later stages of Alzheimer's, it's usually difficult for somebody to live um, on their own, and it may even be difficult for them to live in um, a home setting, depending on the type of care that they need, as well as what their preferences are. So Alzheimer's disease is a serious issue. And right now there is no cure. But what actually happens in the brain? Well, You've probably heard about plaques and tangles. These plaques and tangles are in the brain. So there's something that would be seen under a microscope. It's not usually something that you could look at um, if you could see your brain, if you could sort of x-ray vision through the skull. You can't really notice those. They're microscopic changes. The plaques are composed of a protein called amyloid beta-42, and it's called 42 because it's made up of 42 amino acids. And amino acids are just the little building blocks of protein. The tangles, on the other hand, are tangles of the neurofibrils. So that's part of the nerve cells that make up the brain. And those are composed of a protein called tau. Now tau normally is an important protein in, the, in the maintaining the structure of cells uh, in the brain. But when it becomes hyperphosphorylated, so when there's hyperphosphorylated tau protein, that can contribute to the formation of tangles. So amyloid making up the plaques and phosphorylated tau making up the tangles. But it's not just about plaques and tangles. There are changes to the blood vessels as well. Vascular changes, we would call them. And as I mentioned, if somebody has stroke risk factors, they're more likely to have more blood vessel changes. And this seems to worsen the symptoms that the person has. There are also theories about oxidative stress. So um, you've heard of antioxidants. So maybe if we have more of those, it'll reduce the oxidative stress on the brain cells. And so there will be less damage. You might've heard Alzheimer's disease referred to as type three diabetes. And that's because there does seem to be some connection between Alzheimer's 
as well as glucose metabolism and insulin resistance in the body. So that means that the tissues don't seem to be as responsive to insulin as in people who don't have Alzheimer's. So looking at all of those things, those are potential uh, targets that a treatment could go after. We're still developing our understanding of how Alzheimer's disease works. A lot of people want to know about the genetics of Alzheimer's. So a lot of times when I tell someone um, that they're living with dementia or at risk for dementia, they will think about their own family history and um, they kind of want to know how much that is a factor in Alzheimer's. The truth is that in later onset Alzheimer's, which is about 90 to 95 percent of all cases of Alzheimer's, genetics don't really play that big of a role. If you have a first degree relative who's living with Alzheimer's, that probably does increase your risk of getting it if they got it later in life. So probably it would double your lifetime risk. But it doesn't mean that you'll definitely get Alzheimer's if, for example, your parent has it. Now in younger onset Alzheimer's, so Alzheimer's that comes on below the age of 60, it's a different story. In younger onset Alzheimer's, the genetic factors seem to be much more important. And we sometimes see clusters of family groups where there is a high risk of younger onset Alzheimer's disease. And in those people, the genetic inheritance patterns um, are sometimes ones that we can figure out by doing genetic testing on those individuals and those families. And what do these gene mutations actually do to affect the Alzheimer's risk? Well, genes that we know about, like presenilin-1 and presenilin-2, uh, they seem to affect the production of amyloid beta. So people have more amyloid beta and more difficulty getting rid of it in those genetic mutations. A chromosome 21 is another gene that can sometimes be affected in some types of Alzheimer's. And people who were born with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome almost universally will develop Alzheimer's at some stage. Plaques and tangles are found throughout the brain. Um, and those are things that we see in a microscope. But some changes can be seen on a bigger level. We often see shrinkage in sort of the temporoparietal area of the brain. And we know that the plaques and tangles seem to be more pronounced in an area of the brain called the hippocampus. It is a seahorse shaped lobe of the brain. And it's very closely tied in with memory function and emotional regulation. Uh, we can see that the hippocampus shrinks. And also we can sometimes see that there are changes called sclerosis or gliosis. Those might be seen on a scan, but they might not. So most of the time, the scans that we do for Alzheimer's disease are to rule out other brain changes. Oftentimes, the CT scans and MRIs in Alzheimer's disease are normal, especially early on. There are lots of other things that can increase a person's risk of getting Alzheimer's disease, and that includes things like stroke, smoking, a sedentary lifestyle, and a head injury. All of those things do seem to be associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's um, or of uh, getting it earlier than, so it might accelerate the processes that are already going on. So it's important to try to avoid those things, especially the things that are modifiable, like smoking and exercise levels. So what are some of the treatments that have been looked at in treating the symptoms of Alzheimer's? And are any of them potentially a cure? BASE inhibitors. BASE stands for beta amyloid secretase inhibitor. Beta amyloid secretase inhibitors interfere with the production of the amyloid precursor protein. If there's less precursor protein, there's gonna be less amyloid. Usually the way that a medication comes to market is that it's first developed in a Petri dish and if it does what it's been designed to do or it's been found to do, then studies are done in animals and then in humans. The base inhibitor studies in mammals were very promising. And in human trials, it did produce 80 to 90% lower levels of amyloid in people who had the beta secretase inhibitors. But this didn't translate into an improved memory. And in fact, cognition functions seem to get worse. So I'm not sure we're gonna be seeing this coming down the pipeline. What about ABAD inhibitors? So ABAD stands for amyloid binding alcohol dehydrogenase. So the amyloid normally has effects on the mitochondria of the healthy neurons in the brain. And the ABAD inhibitor 
can interfere with that. This would neutralize the amyloid and it wouldn't cause as much damage to the brain cells. These compounds have been studied in animals, but not humans yet, so stay tuned. There's also an interesting little compound called methylene blue. Methylene blue is a dye. That's why its color is in its name. Methylene blue is from a class of medications called phenothiazines, and it's been used in the treatment of malaria and some psychiatric disorders like depression. But it may have efficacy in treating Alzheimer's disease as well. No phase three human trials yet, so that is looking at phase three trials are when they sort of try to look and see if the medication um, does what it says it's gonna do in humans, but it is in phase two trials, which is sort of looking at safety and tolerability. That would be interesting. What about antioxidants? Well, a lot of them have been studied, including uh, coenzyme Q, um, vitamin C and vitamin E, and numerous other antioxidant compounds, but the results have not been very promising. And then there's insulin. Insulin delivered through the nose seems to have some benefit. So a patient initially told me about, you know, that insulin could be used in Alzheimer's disease. And it's given through the nose because it's thought that, that the insulin then would go directly to the brain because your olfactory nerve in your nose is directly connected to your brain. So it kind of makes sense that if you're squirting insulin in your nose, it will go to the brain tissue so it doesn't have to cross the blood-brain barrier in that. And then also there would be less risk of getting hypoglycemia, so a low blood sugar, because that's what insulin's job is, is to kind of lower blood sugar. The studies that have been done in insulin are small. So I did read a meta-analysis of all of the well-designed studies that have been done in insulin and either mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. They came up with, a, the, so combining all those studies together, it was looking at a total of 293 patients. It did seem to stabilize uh, function. So um, it reduced the decline in memory testing. So it seemed to help the most of all the memory tests they did with short-term memory. And it seemed to stabilize the person's level of function. So that would be very interesting. There were some side effects, but most of them were um, very mild and there didn't seem to be a lot of hypoglycemia. So it's not really ready for mainstream, but it might be something that might catch on. The new treatment that I think is the most exciting is immunotherapy. You could think of this as sort of a vaccine against Alzheimer's. This would be giving somebody an antibody against the amyloid beta protein. So the body would use these antibodies to break down that amyloid or clear more of it out of the brain. So there'd be less Alzheimer's pathology. Some early studies of these antibodies were not favorable. So there seemed to be a higher risk of inflammation of the brain and some worsening cognitive effects. So there's been ongoing research though, the, those compounds are still being looked at, but they're kind of being refined to be smaller molecules, um, sort of chemically, biochemically speaking, and that seems to cause fewer side effects. So they all kind of end in the, in the little um, phrase MAB, because that I guess shows that they're an antibody or AMAB, they're an amyloid antibody. So there's aducanumab, there is crinezumab and gantanerumab. And there's another one that is mercifully called ALS-801. ALS-801 is really exciting because it's an oral medication. So the other compounds are infusions that someone would have to get intravenously, but only about once per month. So those compounds are pretty exciting. With the, as they've sort of refined the size of the molecules and that, there seem to be fewer side effects and they do seem to have some effects on the symptoms of Alzheimer's. So again, it's not a cure. Um, it doesn't seem to completely um, reduce the amyloid and we know that amyloid isn't the whole story, but it is quite an appealing target. And I think that the most hopeful new medications that we have are going after that amyloid target. So it's really exciting to see if those medications are gonna hit prime time 
in the next little while. And it'll be exciting to see uh, if they can make a difference in the lives of people living with dementia and their families. There are lots of other treatments that people have talked about in uh, the prevention or treatment of dementia. And that's a very long list. So things like a ketogenic diet or a ketone drink, um, certain types of cognitive exercises or physical exercise, coconut oil, uh, ginkgo biloba, cumin, turmeric, uh, ginseng, all kinds of things. We don't have good evidence that for any of those things that I've mentioned. So there's a lot of promising evidence and I've talked about that in some of my other articles and videos, but there's nothing really that is the standard of care right now that we're recommending for everybody. I think the exciting thing is that there is ongoing research into Alzheimer's disease. There are thousands of studies out there and there are lots of people looking at many different ways to attack the Alzheimer's disease problem and other types of dementia. So I'm very hopeful that we're gonna have newer treatments and we're gonna get a better understanding of what Alzheimer's disease is. I don't know if we'll ever be able to reduce it completely to zero, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to find new ways of treating it. When I diagnose someone with Alzheimer's, medication is only one part of the treatment. The other parts are education, uh, exercise, diet, socializing, and planning ahead for the future. So those components won't change, even if the medication component changes. If you've heard about some new treatments for Alzheimer's, I would love to hear about it. So leave me a comment down below and I'll look into it and see what the scientific research that I have access to um, says about it. Uh, I do learn a lot from my patients. A lot of them come in with um, things that they've read that they want to share with me. So I'd love to hear from you if you have anything to share. I'm so thankful that you joined me here today and I hope you'll stay here on YouTube and watch some more of my videos. I do have quite a few videos about dementia, Alzheimer's and other types. But there's also all that information on my website, therinkle.ca, so please go over there. Everything, um, all of my articles and videos are there, and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. And on any one of those platforms, including here on YouTube, you can interact with me and ask me questions or share your experience. I'm just so glad you joined me today, and I look forward to seeing you again here on The Wrinkle.